first things first on the illest. I'll drop that and hear the whole world feel it. I hate you so much. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And I'm Dan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. We didn't tell Dan how we start this thing ever. I, I picked it up, more yeah. or less. No, you're, you're good, you're good. Uh, yes, we have a special guest today, and that is Dan. Dan is our uh, expert. Our Umberto expert. Oh, I'm not an expert on Umberto Echo. That's true, Neither none of us are. <clears throat> but Umberto Echo died uh, about a month ago now. And... Oh, right, we're in the future. We're always <laughs> broadcasting from the past, that's true. <laughs> but I was wondering if you were going to question him on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> one of the things that, that sits sort of at home for all of us is the concept of, in varying ways, of Umberto Eco's library. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to talk about Umberto Eco's library, we're going to talk about libraries in general, and, and sort of how we find solace in them. First, Icebreaker. Dan, you're the guest. You go first. What are, what is one of your formative books? The books, one of the books that informs who you are. Uh, we're gonna have to go with uh, "Who Has Seen the Wind" for five hundred, Jim. Uh, Seen the Wind by O. W. Mitchell. Excellent. O. W. Mitchell. Uh, it's, on. getting it in there. Yeah, of course. Um, it is one of those books that I have read multiple times. Uh, the first time I read it, I was a teenager, so. You know, you're like 16, and you read a book about a small boy in a, in a farm town out in the middle of nowhere, mm-hmm. and you sort of are like, whatever, how is this even relevant? It's sort of okay, I guess. It's well written. You know, there's some nice images. Uh, I read it again in university uh, as part of a, um, a Canadian literature course, um, and I loved it the second time. And then I've read it probably twice since then, and it's one of those books where every time I read it, I discover something new. Right, and so when I think of sort of books for me that are formative, I think what are books that sort of show me what books are and what books do. So one of the things that books do and that books are for me is microcosms, and and sort of who has seen mm-hmm. the wind is this perfect microcosm of a place where, you know, the flat prairie meets the sky. It's got everything. It's got religion. It's got um, growing up. It's got love. It's got life. It's got death. It's got um, uh, God just smashing the crap out of Bent Candy's barn because he's just a freaking dick. And it's sort of like God or Ben Candy. Well, I mean, it depends on which God you're looking at. If it's Old Testament God, both of them. Um, but it's those sort of things that, like, sort of every every person growing up kind of just needs to know about, right? Mm-hmm. All sort of condensed into a book. And even though, I mean, it's obviously very dated in, in when it sort of takes place, it's it's still sort of relevant, I find, to sort of my own growing process and my own sort of process of interest. And every time I read it, I sort of look at it from a different point of view, and I, I find different things fascinating. I mean, the first time I read it, I found the story of the boy interesting, but all the sort of religious stuff and spiritual stuff in the background, utterly and completely boring. And then the last time I read it, the story of the boy was just like this whiny, bratty boy who didn't get anything. And I'm like, shut up, kid. But all that spiritual stuff was all of a sudden very interesting, right? So it sort of yep. changes every time you read it. And it changes depending on what lenses you're looking at and stuff like that. So that just it sort of sticks with me, I guess. Huck? So um, this time around, my formative book I chose was um, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Ooh. Uh, the first book in the uh, the Roosevelt trilogy. Um, I came across the reference... Most famous, I believe, for its sequel, uh, FDR Strikes Back. Oh. <laughs> in Return of the New Deal. <laughs> um, so so this one I came across um, shortly after I got into a... Uh, there's a blog out there called The Art of Manliness, and they recommended it as a, as a, a book to check out. Um, also, the kind of the mythological aspect of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and so i just gotten into the idea of reading biography, biographies of famous individuals to, you know, see how they grew up and how they lived and whatnot. And so the first half of the book's really interesting in terms of, like, you know, the, the kinds of activities that he did, the kind of experiences that he had. Ultimately, I was too old to really get anything out of it, but it was really interesting. I mean, it plays into that fallacy that if you understand how a famous person grew up, you have access to what makes them a genius. I, I understand that that's wrong, but it's still fun to partake in it when you're reading through it. So, you know, like world travel or um, these particular sets of, you know, like combinations of sports mm-hmm. and reading and whatnot. Uh, but then it really got interesting when in this, I think I read this about five years ago now, 
um, when I hit the age that he was at or I'm at. And so you start to do the comparisons of, yeah. you know, like... You're yeah. like, where am I in comparison to Theodore Roosevelt? Yeah, and you, you tend to do that, you know, uh, every once in a while you have your existential moments and you'll you'll just kind of sit back and be like, man, by this age, such and such accomplished this. Wow, I barely have a full-time job, you know? Uh, <laughs> I'm still grappling with this concept of being an adult. And meanwhile, this other person is, you know, doing this or doing that. And I'm not saying, again, it's... it's He's running for president. I'm a giant man, baby. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying, like, every person needs to... Thank me. <laughs> I'm not saying every person needs to read biographies, but... Um, it, was, it was my first foray into it in terms of... Uh, uh, personal development or kind of self-critical reflection by by glimpsing into the life of somebody else um, and it was really I mean there's been some criticisms about how it was written it, it tends to be written more narratively mm -hmm. than, than a typical biography it tends to put you into the story um, but I honestly didn't get turned off by it I mean when he, they're, they're describing him in the Dakotas you know kind of this impromptu sheriff chasing after bandits and then bringing them back to justice kind of deal you know, it's kind of, it's fun because, again, Theodore Roosevelt is, like, so mythological in, in who he, sta as he is in the American, you know, kind of uh, historical. He's basically a comic book character. He is. In some sense, he is a comic book character. Um, so Such a larger-than-life personality. Like, even if he was kind of a crappy person for various reasons, um, there's still elements of him that are kind of, like, awe-inspiring. Um, and so, yeah, it's it was like the first um, biography that I read, and it was it was really interesting. So that's my uh, formative book for this time around. Nice. It seems deeply formative. I mean, surprised I didn't come up with it the first time we asked that question two seasons ago. That's <laughs> you have lots of formative books. Everybody's got lots. Yeah, yeah, it's it's what for me it's a hard question to answer because I've got dozens, and every time <laughs> I think of one, I think of it's a Hydra problem. I think of five more, and then five more. And well, then you'll I'm... just have to come on next season and do some more book podcasts. <laughs> I'm not going to say no. So, Jim, what is your formative book? Uh, my formative book My formative book last time around was uh, Maniac McGee in our last episode on books in season one. Of course. Uh, which, yeah, of course. Anybody <laughs> who, who knows the least bit about me knows that that's one of my formative books. The other one is a little, is m if anything, more obscure than, than Maniac McGee, and that's Earthweb by Mark Stiegler, which I read when I was about 15. And... Earthweb is it's a science fiction book unsurprisingly and it dis it, it the, the the one sentence description is it describes weaponized connectedness used in defense of humanity um it's from about 1992 1993 and it envisions this interconnected world um, through the internet, live you know, things like live streaming, and it's used by people to fight these giant space death machines that show up once every five years or so, which is a little weird. But they've organized the international economy in some ways around the ability to help a team of people beat these machines. And, you know, before they can wipe all life off of Earth. And what that involves is teams, of, not just teams of researchers sitting around watching, you know, watching and, and waiting. It's, it's broadcast all over the world because anyone could know a thing that they need to know. And they need to be able to communicate that immediately. Even if that's just to put it on the radar of researchers. And so they, they create an economy where you can make money at it. And you can, you, can, you can get fantastically wealthy helping save the world. Um, there's a line from Planetary, um, which is a comic book series by... Why can I not remember the writer of Planetary? He also wrote... Uh, Transmetropolitan and Warren Ellis. Warren Ellis. Thank you. And uh, in it, um, the superheroes, he says, if you save the world, it will pay you back every day. And Earthweb is a book in which everyone gets to save the world. 
and so it it, it it in some sense it's a vision of the internet that we I don't know that we could have had and certainly in some places that we do have as this sort of intensely collaborative thing where everyone is part of something and I look at the internet that we actually have and I'm, I'm sort of disappointed by it but but it was one of those books that really hit me as a kid and still does as, as a grown up and it reminds me of things like uh, everything from there the, there's, there's a big section on, on the notion of brands and personal brand to just the the fact of shared experience and shared ideas and the notion that the, the idea that saves the world doesn't necessarily go, aha, it goes, huh. So there's a lot in there. It's, it's, I don't know if it's a good book. Like the thing with formative books is they're not necessarily good books, but they're, they're part of you. And Earthweb is definitely part of me. When you say uh, weaponized interconnectedness, I just thought like dropping bombs on Twitter or like via Twitter. I'm going to tweet bombs at the aliens. Kind of. Um, the interesting thing about about it is, and somebody hypothesized this, like they talk about it in the book, is that these these death machines, they're called Shivas for reasons. Um, is Shiva's the god of death? And well, yeah, but I mean, it's just sort of a name that people give to them. Hmm. But they, you know, they've got missiles and bombs and laser weapons, and they 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 park in orbit and you know nuke whole cities and things like that. But someone someone mentions the fact that these things have so much mass that if someone really wanted to destroy the Earth, all they would have to do is crash a Shiva into it, and it would be gone. No one knows who's sending them. No one knows why, but. The, the impression that is given is that they aren't there to actually destroy the planet. Because if they were, there's better ways to do it. They're there to test and prepare humanity for something. And you never find out what. Like, it's, it's, that, that's, that's not the thing that matters about the book. The thing that matters about the book is the ways in which everyone in it is interconnected. So they just, instead of calling them Shivas, they just could have called them MacGuffins and been, you know, done with mm -hmm. it? Basically. <laughs> I don't mean to be pedantic. <laughs> I got caught up on you on the concept of parking a spaceship. <laughs> you can park a spaceship. How do you park a spaceship? Like, it's, at, never, at no point is it actually like parked stationary. No, at no point is anything stationary. I know, but relative to, the, like, the Earth, which is usually the frame of reference you're <clears throat> talking about. Sure. That's um, what you would consider geosynchronous orbit. Yeah, but like there's there's a huge bit of difference between like something that's you know a couple hundred kilometers away because I'm assuming you'd want to park a fair distance away, and then, like you know that's kind of like the whole idea of like the outside there, of a spoke is moving there's faster. No, there's there's multiple there's multiple definitions of parking. For one, you can park and you can remain still, and the Earth revolves below you. Ultimately. You park in relation to a spot on the Earth, like you would park, say, a car, mm. and you revolve with the Earth. Mm. But it's also the, the... Like, your car is parked outside right now, assuming your car is in the parking lot. Yeah, we don't know if that's true or not. But, <laughs> but, the, but the, other, the other problem is is the concept of parking relative to a point on the Earth, but not physically touching it, whereas my car is always in contact. If I'm doing it right, it's always in contact with the Earth. You park boats... But it's, it's in contact with the water which is on the earth. Speaking of parking, there was this guy in Birdo Echo, and he parked a bunch of books on the shelves in his library. Thank you, Dan. Yes, break us, break me out of the pedantic thing. That's, I just, that's, uh, that's for next podcast. <laughs> I just got so oh. hung up on that. So. I noticed. So, so Umberto Echo's library. Um, what is it? Like when when someone says Umberto Echo's library, they don't just mean all of the books inside Umberto Eco's house. And he had a considerable amount of them. Tens of thousands. Yeah. But it's it's this... Con it, it, it unpacks this concept about... Uh, people would always ask him, how many of these books have you actually read? And he would just sort of shake his head. Uh, because it wasn't about how many books he had read. It was about how many books he could read at a moment's notice. The library was full of all these things he didn't know 
and sort of that idea that the books that you haven't read are just as important as the ones that you have because you never know when you're going to need that information and it's sort of at your fingertips and he had it available and uh this sort of brings in ideas of synchronicity. So if, for instance, you're reading a book about American history and you want to read something similar, you don't have to go far to get it. You probably already have something. Mm-hmm. Um, or just to sort of discovering what you, what you have again. So you might discover another book that is, is related to the first one in a way that you didn't know about, that was mm-hmm. unexpectedly related or unexpectedly interesting or, or something like that. So it's sort of an idea of, of pretend, potential. Mm-hmm. So... I adore books that I could read. We are in my apartment, and this is not a green screen behind us. These are my, some of my bookshelves. Well, there's five books than less than there was here ten minutes ago, because some of them were mine, and I'm taking them home. <laughs> that seems fine. <laughs> um, seven, counting the books I gave you guys tonight. Yeah. Well, there we go. But, yeah, I mean, these are, these are three, they're stacked three deep, two to three deep. And there's, I don't know, probably four or five more shelves in my apartment that you can't see on camera. Uh, I have a lot of books, mm-hmm. and I come by them honestly. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it is is about, yeah, the books I go looking for. Whether that's a book from my past that I need to like read and reflect on, or whether that's a book that I, I, I want to read or I need to read or I need for a specific subject and whether that's a reference book, a language book. I have tons and tons of fiction because fiction is how I roll. But it's all just here. You know, I don't necessarily need both of my Athanasa textbooks which help me translate ancient Greek on Twitter <laughs> every once in a while. But sometimes I do. When someone's like, whoa, what would this be in ancient Greek? I'm like, well, ha, ha, ha. Let me dust off my schoolboy lessons. <laughs> Mostly it's helping writers translate stuff in Latin. Well, it's interesting because I used to use the sort of same idea. I've also got sort of a, a collection of books where I would, often I would just buy them. If they were cheap, 25 cents, vaguely interesting. Hmm. For 25 cents, I might read it. I might not read it. But it may yeah, be interesting. You don't feel bad. I don't feel bad. And so uh, sort of over the years, I've sort of acquired this collection. And it was especially handy in university when I would have to write a paper. And like English papers, you need a bunch of sources. And sometimes you'd have two or two and a half. And one of them didn't work out. So you would need more. And I'm a procrastinator. So, of course, you know, the paper's <laughs> due in seven hours. I don't have time to go to the library. And I would just sort of hunt around my shelves until I found something relevant. And I always did. Um, I was lucky I had this sort of big book of Emerson essays, and Emerson wrote about everything. I mean, I literally, or figuratively, uh, once pulled a, an Emerson book of Emerson essays off the shelf, opened it to a random page, and I used that essay. Like, And it's just sort of that idea that you have things at your fingertips that are, are, are possible. Um, and I don't do that so much now. I don't write a lot of papers anymore, but I still read, you know, and it's often it'll be interesting to sort of I'll read something. And I'm still in the mood for something similar. And I know that somewhere on my shelves, I have something that'll that'll fill that gap, yep. even if I haven't looked at it in 10 years and I can go and sort of pace around and find it. Mm. Uh, now, of course, we live in a post fact world. That is the way I define I've defined it, I think, in the past on the podcast is that notion that any almost any fact that you need anything you would need to know you can google it yeah i think i think maybe a, a post fact is kind of nice i would say it's uh, extended cognition yeah i mean i i would i would i would, I would agree that those are the, basically the same thing like we, extremely handy is yeah. how i classify it I mean, <laughs> but it's 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 that notion that that you you know if you need to know something it and, is it is a google and anything way. Like the most like and, and my you know, my partner does this to me all the time. Well she'll ask me some really bizarre question and the way she phrases it, I'm saying like, Google it. Like exactly the way you phrase it. Like how what is the average quill density of a porcupine? Well, just Google that and yep. you will know. It will tell you it is on there, right? You will find it. What was the thing that I Googled um for the last podcast, the leap year podcast? Um when is the next leap year day on a Monday? And I'm like, oh, it, it turns out that like I was I was about to like go through calendars and look, and then I I googled it, and sure enough, the internet has the answer for that. It's probably from uh, Wolfram Alpha. That's no, usually, no, no, actually, it I wasn't. didn't, I didn't, I didn't use Wolfram Alpha. Yeah. Wow, because that's usually like where all of the those weird calendar and, and mathematical 
questions come from or answers come from. Yeah, you can get some weird stuff. Like Wolfram Alpha is like the next level for that. Is yeah. if you need to know something really weird, like how many calories there are in three hundred cubic meters of butter, <laughs> Wolfram Alpha can tell you. What the hell do you spend your time googling? It's a long story. <laughs> there's a there's another great um, internet sort of thing related to libraries. I think it's called. Um, the Babel Project or something like that. I can look Oh, up. yes, the yeah, Babel yeah. Project. But, I mean, it's got every collection of text in English under 3,000 letters or yep. something, or 5,000 letters, ever written or that ever will be written. It's organized in such a way that it, it can access any collection of letters, any random. So if you've written something that you think is absolute genius and you type it into this thing, it will tell you the shelf and the, pay, the book and the page that that text is already on and has been on forever, essentially. Monkeys on typewriters. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's that sort of idea, yeah. but it's all there and it's all compiled in one place. Like, anything you can think of, any bit of Shakespeare, any bit of anything, any bit of thing that you're pretty sure is absolutely original genius, anything that you're going to say ever in your life that's under 3,000 characters, it's already there. And that idea is just sort of unsettling. <laughs> it is, it's- and that's the day Huck quit Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Every, All your tweets have already been written, my friend. Every single tweet. Even the really bad ones yeah. that you don't actually hit send on, which is 90% of my tweets I don't actually send. <laughs> it's like calling a girl, you know. <laughs> tweet? No, 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 I can't tweet. Cancel, cancel, cancel. <laughs> yeah. Well, same with like... We have very different experiences on that. <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, so it's it's one of those things so where I gotta, I gotta interject. You don't yeah? you don't tweet and accidentally get her father. That's like the that was the old. You thing. could <laughs> accidentally <laughs> at mention her father. I, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, continue. Um, well, after that, but no, there's little <laughs> kinds of internet projects like that. Uh, everything from um, things like Project Gutenberg to just index text to there's a there's a subreddit. Um, Slash uh, TIL. Today I learned. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is just the weirdest collection of facts, which are also true. Allegedly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, more, <laughs> more often than not. Um, because they're, they're all sort of peer-reviewed. And it's, it's really weird, but it's like a, it's a peer-reviewed sort of FAQ for life. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a weird, weird, it's one of those Reddits that, the subreddits that's sort of happily very nice, but it's very weird. I um, like to have the table here. Then I don't have to worry about what I have to do with my hands. Right? This is why we have the table. It's very nice. Usually, well, usually the camera is pointed up enough that I can, like, do this with my hands and you don't see Yeah, them. you don't. things you don't know about the podcast is that Ryan rubs his hands like an evil mastermind the entire time. I do. I do. Sometimes I don't even wear pants. That's not true. You Ryan can't verify that. Shut you up. Can't we verify that? I you you no. can now. I could not be wearing pants. Maybe they're in my car, which may or may not be in the parking lot. So the solace of our libraries, though, like we, I mean, we talked a lot in the pre-show about not just the the like like the the magnificence of Umberto Eco's library exists in its potentiality, but there are lots and lots of ways that we find solace in books for me uh, in the last books podcast we talked about how my library is sort of narcissistic and and chronological but also like I don't need to read these books for them to settle my mind I just need to come out here and touch them and it's weird and stupid but the very presence of of all of these books is comforting. I mean, I, I don't even have to touch them in some cases. Like, I've got my chair in the corner that I like to read in, and from there I can see several shelves. And I will often sometimes just sit there and just read titles. Mm-hmm. Like, and I mean, they're mm-hmm. far away, and if I don't have my glass, I kind of got to squint. But, like, and sometimes I'll just, I'll just be reading through titles, and I'll hit one that resonates for whatever reason. Maybe something in the book is reminding me of something I'm thinking about. Or, and I have, I've sat there for an hour, half an hour, 45 minutes, thinking about that book, trying to remember what I could remember, um, sometimes I'll go pluck it off the shelf, reread a few pages, sort of re-enjoy that, that experience. And it's nice to sort of always have a, um, I mean, it's sort of, it's a trope I think you've heard probably from book lovers before that some of their best friends are books, right? And it's that, that idea that you can have some of those same experiences that you have with friends, old friends with books. Like mm-hmm. you can go back to an old book and, and remember things about it and remember experiences with it and things you've learned and things you've enjoyed. It's sort of interesting. Mm-hmm. 
the, the interesting thing about uh, part about that for me is that um i the the my my experience of old friends is actually i mean what i'm recalling is me is how i was when i read that book way back when and that is sort of a lovely feeling mm mm-hmm. and yeah i can i can get that feeling by reading the title yeah in a lot of in a lot of cases i don't have to go through and read the whole book i can read the title it pulls it pulls me back to where i was and it pulls me away from whatever is pressing on me in the moment my library tends to be it kind of it, so it oscillates like it's somewhat decorative in my apartment just because I haven't read a lot of them so it's not quite the utilitarian it's not but, it's not a thing we worry about here man. No, no it's not but, not even a little bit <laughs> but uh, sometimes when I when I force myself to really like kind of quiet the mind and think about it um, I tend to view the library as and I, it's, it's I think one step removed from the idea of, of your best friends it's um, in good company I mean, like, there's good books and there's bad books, obviously. Like, yeah. some, some books, like, are, you know, they're kind of like a bad company thing, but... Um, you can defenestrate those ones. You, I mean, I, I have a hard time doing that, even with... Only in extreme stuff. cases. <laughs> but with with my books and I look around, you know, like, somebody sat down and, and put their effort into writing it. And it can be a, a little bit of a one-sided conversation, but it's ultimately... Um, in company with other minds and so that's that's all often when i'm not looking at them as books that's where, where i'll drift into is is looking at my my library and then i get some comfort in that that it's it is that you know vast wealth of things that i don't know uh that i could learn from other people or i could discover for myself in some sense but um that's that's how i view my library i also love the smell of books oh yeah i think everybody yeah. does i think that, that one of the things that people who identify as readers the do, older the better yeah i've got a pre-war copy of prisoner of zenda kicking around oh yeah and it's uh it's good it's it's good the, think, the smell of glue is very strong i think the oldest book i have is from the late 1900s it's a copy of um the temptation of saint anthony nice and i don't pull it off the shelf very much um, in fact, I think I have a second copy that I did the reading. I found this one in an old bookstore in St. Jacobs or something. But every once in a while, I kind of gently wedge it out from its its companions and sort of smell it. It's got sort of really great old illustrations and the binding the leathers kind of coming apart. Some, on, old, on the but. shelf behind me, there's some uh, philosophy of medicine texts. Uh, I want to say Sir Thomas More. But... Uh, I'm not 100 percent without without looking at them, but they're actually it sounds they're, legit. They're bound with uh, <laughs> bits of the first edition Webster's dictionary, <laughs> um, and I found them in this old bookstore for like a dollar. I, I just I bought them purely on the basis of their oldness and their yep. sort of interestingness. Like I've done that texturally. Yeah, I'm like for a dollar. I don't care what's in this book. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. Oh, I actually have a collection of things I found in secondhand books. So receipts, bookmarks, notes, oh, um, yeah. all you that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, find the coolest bookmarks. Yeah, you find, like, the coolest stuff that people have used. Like, little bits and bobs of things. Like, I got some, like, receipt from, like, 1960-something. And it's like, wow, I have vegetables library are super cheap. From, uh, <laughs> yeah, all somewhere. that great kind of old stuff. Yeah. Used books are the best. Anyone who tells you new books are better is lying. No, they are lying. Unless they run a bookstore, in which case, buy their books. I think the, old, <laughs> I think the oldest book that I have, um, it's either early 1900s or maybe super, super late 1800s. Is a book that I grabbed out of Richard's office when, so when Richard retired. I got a, <laughs> I got a garbage bag. Richard Holmes is a professor in the yeah. University of Waterloo Philosophy Department. Yeah, and when he and retired... This. My office was down the hall, and I got a garbage bag of his books. Yes, everybody came out to scavenge. All my his existentialist books. books came from him. Yeah, I grabbed some of his pragmatism books. Um, the oldest book that I grabbed, though, it's not even in English. It's written in Latin. <laughs> I don't even know what it's about. I clearly, <laughs> I clearly can't read it. There's, there's a wheel locks back here. I mean, yeah, no, <laughs> it's actually the wheel locks. No, there's, there's another one back here. here. Oh, that's the workbook. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the workbook is super important, though. Mm, true. Oh no, that's my mother's wheel locks. <laughs> well, there you go. So, so yeah. Come the, on, honestly. The oldest book I have, I because I, I, I know the reason why I know that is because at least the numbers are yeah, in yeah. the front of the book show you. But um, yeah, it's not. It's 
I had to yeah. get it just because of the age of it. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that, like the things it, it's 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 easy to think about the things that fascinate you about books. Like I mean, texture, content, potential. There's a there's a lot going on there, and I think that that's true with any sort of media. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but books are just what do it for us. Yeah, there's a nostalgia for books. Like I never got into e-readers. I just can't do it. There's something to me that about that, literally, like curling up in a comfy chair with a blanket and a book and a cup of tea mm-hmm. and one light in an otherwise dark room and just reading. Like that mm-hmm. just really kind of fits my comfort zone, mm-hmm. right? And that's just that's something I've always done. So it's an, it's that's nostalgia is part of it, but also it's that idea that I'm handling an object that somebody else has handled, especially yeah. in secondhand books, or that multiple people have handled. Um, whereas, you know, you get the e-reader and it's not, it's not the same. Mm-hmm. I was so excited when I got my Kindle, the, the idea of carrying 10,000 books in my yeah, pocket. That's so cool. Speak. That's a cool idea. But, but it's hard, you know, I, and at first I was very skeptical of the idea of having a physical copy of a book in your hand as somehow being superior. But yeah. I don't know if it's because I eventually found those essays to be persuasive <laughs> or I just discovered it on my own or because I'm a pretentious hipster or something like that. But <laughs> like... I, I told you guys in the pre-show when I get an order of from Amazon, the first thing I do when I crack the books is to smell them. The first yeah. thing I did when you threw me Worthington Heights was I cracked it and I, I smelt the pages. There's just something about physically having the books in your hands, ability, the ability to like have your own marginalia. I mean, you can yeah. annotate an ebook, but it's it's not the same to me. Uh, and I don't know if I could even do it for like a textbook. Like it's for for me. Part of it is I have a lot of old sci-fi and fantasy books that I inherited, and some of them are orphaned. Uh, less than I thought. It turns out I've been writing um, book nerd over at Mad Art Lab for the past six months or so, and uh, continually, I guess, indefinitely into the future. About which is just uh, uh, every two weeks I write an article about an old sci-fi book or fantasy book that I pull off my shelf and read. And one of the things I always do, I don't ever, I never Google the book until after I finish reading it, and then I Google it, and I find out you know context and information. And one of the things I always check is if there's an ebook. And so far, I think two out of the five or six books that I've done don't have ebooks. Like, but they they don't have ebooks. There there are the physical copies of these books are the only copies in existence. And when they are gone, these books will be gone. Now, some of them are very bad. <laughs> um, go read Planet of the Wizard Bros. <laughs> but the fact that they will be gone means that. We will if if no one has read them, we will not know what we have missed. And that that is the to bring it back to Umberto Echo's library, a lot of it is about being able to know what you don't know. Yeah. Part of the other like one of the things I do like about things like ebook readers and, and those kind of text readers is uh, you mentioned Project Gutenberg earlier. Yeah. And there's a lot of books that on there that you can get now that are old, like hundreds of years old, for instance, or, or mm-hmm. you know, just older, that are hard to find in good editions. Like, they just, they don't reprint them. But somebody has sort of managed to get a copy of it on there, and it's easier mm-hmm. to get there. You don't have to go hunting for it. And I mean, in those cases, for whatever reason, I did I, I did wind up reading a bunch of sort of obscure older books once um, as part of sort of some some. Uh, research and experiments and stuff I was doing but it was sort of nice to have that and that's sort of one thing I think that would be good for yeah it's if you can't afford books even here are here are books for you yeah um there's an interesting sort of and there and in the last sort of 10 years there's been a really interesting really interesting shift in like the bias of those books there's a lot more diversity there yeah than there used to be it's mm-hmm. not just white man canon yeah although a lot of it is still white man canon But uh, pour one out for Umberto Eco, and uh, at the very least, his library. Yeah. Well, I bet you it got scavenged good, eh? <laughs> I'm just saying, if I, when I, if I, like, you know, something, if I were to leave here today and get hit by a car and die, I know that my books are in good hands, because Jim has already said that he's going to go scavenge the dibs, crap I did them all, basically. <laughs> um, Even you... Gem, that plant? Yeah. All right. 
gem that shit. <laughs> uh, to find out more, more about what we're reading, you can uh, follow us on Twitter at Wootsuit or individually, and you can find our individual Twitters below. Uh, to listen to more podcasts, you can subscribe on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Mm-hmm. My reading's a secret. Dan's reading is not a secret. You, you, you can what am I reading, Jim? What are you reading currently? Uh, you don't remember. I told you earlier. I know. <laughs> Damn it. I will give you a hint. It's, it's a book about Hitler. Anyway, join these guys next time. I probably <laughs> won't be here. Oh, man. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And I'm Dan. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. Moderation in all things. Including moderation. Nope. That's bullshit. <laughs> Which makes you radical. If you're ra- if you're moderate and you're radical and you're if you're radical wait, no. No, no, it doesn't. That's moderation in all things, including moderation, is the first year shithead <laughs> philosophy course. It's the only course answer. I took. <laughs>